Hello, friends, and welcome to the Bikes for Death podcast. As always, my name is Patrick, and I am your host. And let's start off by giving a shout out to our newest patrons. We have another great group that signed up this week. So this week's newest patrons are Denise Brodigan, James Vineyard, Charles Gurry, Rick Stinson, Joseph Lohorn, Damian Garza, Crispin Holt, and Mikey Hanrahan. Thank you all so much for stepping up to support the show over on patreon.com forward slash bikes or death and to everybody who has really honestly in the last couple of weeks, I got to say um, there's been just an outpouring of support in lots of ways and it's been very stress relieving, I can say, because getting back on the road and I've got all these trips planned, I got big things planned, but it all takes a little bit of money and you know how funny money is. So all your support has been extremely helpful. If you'd like to step up and find a way to support the show, if you like this kind of content and you want to help it keep going, head over to bikesordeath.com. Pretty much anything you click there is an opportunity to support the show. You can sign up as a patron. You can leave a one-time donation on PayPal. While you're there, you could also check out the store. We always have new stuff coming. And speaking of new stuff coming, today at 12 o'clock Central Time, we are releasing the new handmade ceramic mugs that were made by Panda Wares. If you've been following the show on social media, if you're signed up for our newsletter, you will have gotten a blast with pictures and an article about Amanda who created each one of them. If you haven't seen it, let me tell you real quick that we have 13 custom handmade mugs, all of them by Amanda Panda. That's what she likes to go by, Amanda Panda or Panda Wares is her company name. She made each of these unique. They're all different shapes, sizes, colors, designs, handles, everything is completely unique. So each one is a one of one, and you can tell that each one was made with love. I'm hugely flattered by Amanda's work on these, all the effort and the time she put into them. So those are going to be on the website today, 12 o'clock, noon, central time. Get your butt over there and check them out. Like I said, there's only one of each. So if there's one you want, you better scoop it up quick because I have a feeling they might sell out fast. So no FOMO or anything, but you might want to mm, diddly diddly get over there and type in bikes or death forward slash store. And see if you can scoop one up for yourself. Today's episode is partially supported by Experience Fayetteville and the Fayetteville, Arkansas community. Nestled there in the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas, the bike-friendly community of Fayetteville is a picturesque mountain town located in the northwest corner of the state and is surrounded by some of the highest peaks in the mountain range. Fayetteville's backyard is the Ozark National Forest with 1.2 million acres of public land with countless miles of canopy-covered gravel roads and backcountry single-track trails. For race fans, Fayetteville is excited to once again be the host community for this year's Arkansas High Country Race, a 1,000-plus mile ultra-endurance bikepacking race that starts and finishes from Fayetteville's historic downtown square beginning October 9th. Home to bikepacking and gravel roads, big and small, consider Fayetteville as a hub for your next bikepacking adventure. Now, registration for this year's Arkansas High Country Race opens June 1st. Find out more over at experiencefayetteville.com. I also want to remind y'all to go over and check out my friends at hefebike.com. They are not just another e-commerce bike store. Hefe Bike carries products specifically designed with bikepackers and gravel enthusiasts in mind. With brands like K-Lite, Jayhawker carbon wheel sets for bikepackers and gravel, and Curve Walmer Bars, which is where I got mine. Check out these and other products over at hefe.bike. And don't forget, the patrons of the show get an extra 10% off. Today's episode is with the Queen of Pain, Rebecca Rush. This is an episode that I was personally really excited about. 
I've been following Rebecca ever since the eco challenge days and like, you know, the late nineties and early two thousands. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with eco challenge. I know they just revived it recently. So maybe it's a little bit more on people's radars, but you know, Rebecca has been at this a very long time and she's one of those people that has so many accolades, so many experiences so much that it's like hard to squeeze it all into an hour. You know, I'd love to sit down with some of these people for many, many hours and just ask them endless questions. But the great thing about that is we can always do a second episode, right? I would encourage you if you're not familiar with Rebecca to maybe just head over to her Wikipedia page and look at the insane list of accomplishments that she's had. Her accomplishments are great. And she's been at this a long time. And with that comes a lot of wisdom and a lot of perspective. And it was really neat to just hear a lot of her perspectives and thoughts and and just soak up some of her wisdom as somebody who's been doing this a long time. And to this day is still very competitive, very active and a real threat whenever she signs up to race. And actually, speaking of Arkansas high country, she was the first person to set the FKT on the Arkansas high country. And uh, I do ask her if she plans to go and take that back because I believe it was Ashley Carlock who took away her FKT this past year at the Arkansas high country. So I do ask her if uh, she's going to go back and maybe try to take that crown back. All right. Well, there is a lot I could say about Rebecca Rush, but why don't I let Rebecca speak for herself? So without further ado, let's have Miles Arbor take it away with the Bikes or Death theme song. You load up your bike, you ride away from home. You could be with your friends or you could be alone. You ride for a day or maybe more. You just love being in the great outdoors. Everything you need is strapped to your bars, including that new pillow you got from Santa Claus. And then you think, oh shit to yourself. You left that super lightweight tent on the living room shelf. Bikes. Oh, death. Bikes. Oh, oh, death. Podcast. All right. Well, everybody, today I got a very special guest. Rebecca Rush is joining me. Are you in uh, Ketchum, Idaho? Yep. I'm at home um, in Ketchum, and it's just starting to be outdoor bike season. Well, dirt bike season instead of snow bike season. So I'm excited. Are y'all in that weird, it's kind of like slushy, the trails are a little slushy right now? Or? Yeah, it's a good season for gravel riding, trail running, you know, because yeah, it's sort of muddy, snowy, slushy, but I feel like gravel riding has opened up a whole new shoulder season of places to go explore early season. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to uh, come on the podcast and chat for a little bit. It's definitely an honor to have you on. Thanks. It'll be fun to chat adventure racing too and some different stuff. Oh yeah. We're definitely going to get into that. I'm super excited, but I'm going to start with an easy one. What is your official job title? If you had a business card, what would it say on it? Explorer. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. Good answer. You're an officially sponsored Explorer. That's good. I like that. So you've earned the nickname Queen of Pain. When did that come along? Yeah, that's a really old or, you know, a kind of well-rounded nickname that I had for a while. And that's from my adventure racing days. It was um, a magazine that's no longer in publication. They had that, you know, my first like cover girl. And that was the title was Queen of Pain. And so I was kind of dubbed that by the adventure racing community. And and really the gist of that article was, you know, um, I was the captain of my team and it was just basically not quitting and keeping going and so yeah, I was given that by the adventure racing community and it just sort of stuck. <laughs> in your uh, film Blood Road, you mentioned in there, you know, you have this this name of Queen of Pain, but you're like, I don't seek out pain, I think is what you said. What is it that you are seeking? Yeah, I, and that's a really good question. And I, I feel like most ultra endurance athletes can relate to this, um, or really most people. It's like the things that provide us sort of the biggest education or the biggest growth are the really, really hard things. You know, when you push through something that seemed impossible, whether it's graduating from college or whether it's doing a hundred mile mountain bike race or, you know, riding across Iceland on your fat bike, you know, when you do really 
hard, committing, painful things, there's a lot of growth there. And, and that's part of when people ask me, why do you do this stuff? It's that the trail is my teacher in that way. And that these ultra endurance events, yeah, they hurt physically. They're, you know, physically arduous and hard, but I feel like those are the moments where you're tired, you're hungry, you're cold, you're stripped of your defense layers that really you're able to access who you are as a person and you're able to access what's going on in your heart and your soul and you rise to the occasion. And so, yeah, the, the relationship with pain is really that it's, it's a gateway to learning. And so it's not pain in the way that, you know, I want to hurt myself it's actually a doorway, I think, into discovery is the best way to describe it. And I also, my friend Travis Macy talks about this a lot in his book, The Endurance Mindset or The Ultra Mindset, that when we choose to do hard things of our own choosing, it teaches us for those opportunities or the things that we're going to come to in our life that we didn't choose that are hard. You know, a family member has died or you get sick or your house burns down or, you know, we're all going to have hardship in our life. And so actually by choosing it in your sport and your athletics, you're growing as a person to have those tools to take when you haven't chosen the hardship. And I think most endurance athletes or anyone listening here, you can relate to kind of that feeling of flow or, you know, sort of a vision quest that you get on these really long, hard endurance events, that they are a gateway to learning. That's, that's one of the best ways I could describe it. We talk about this a lot, and I think you said it eloquently. The other way I like to look at it is, you know, uh, these endurance efforts, it mimics life, you know, because life isn't always a perfect flow state, you know, life throws challenges at you, like you said, and so does the trail. And so sometimes you're on the downhill and things are coasting and the sun is out and everything is good. And sometimes you're climbing and it's wet and cold and raining, you know, and that's just kind of, I think you're right. It does prepare you for more than just being an endurance athlete, but it really does inform who you are as a person in the world. I'm wondering, this is kind of a big question maybe, but you know, I mean, you've been at this a very long time and you've been pushing your limits and learning about yourself for a while now. It's been a teacher for you to use your words for a while. So can you sum up something that you've learned or a big takeaway that you've been able to like learn about yourself or is that too big of a question? <laughs> I mean, there's so many, you know, a really recent event that I felt like was one of my best executed expeditions of my life was this year's I did Rod Trail Invitational 350 miles in the Alaskan winter self-supported on a fat bike and I really learned along that trail and some of the different things that I've implemented on the trail are basically energy practices of, you know, taking energy from the nature around me, keeping energy inside, giving it out to my husband who was riding with me and really thinking about not just controlling my pedal stroke and my breathing, but I was employing some different breathing techniques and energy techniques that, you know, I've, I've learned in yoga or other places and bringing those into my sport I feel like that's taken me the next level this year. And the big takeaway is learning that I can control my response to the environment around me and I can hold energy in when I need and keep it from moving forward, but I can also give it out and realizing that the source of energy isn't just from the watts in your legs or, you know, how big your lung capacity is. The energy is coming from a lot of different places and the realization that we have the control of how we respond to situations. That was a really big learning for me in this year's I did ride in Alaska. And I felt like the ride wasn't easy, but it was so controlled by me. I wasn't like a pawn in with Alaska, like, you know, raining, snowing on me and providing this sort of canvas. I was creating the canvas. And yes, I was in this hostile environment, but that I had a lot more control than I had thought previously. Whereas sometimes we think, oh, this stuff is all happening to me. And it is, but our response to it is 100% within our control. And that was a really big takeaway just this year. you know. And like you said, I've been doing endurance events my whole entire life, but to finally have the realization that like, I'm actually in control of this ride, nobody else is. And that was really powerful. And 
I just felt so strong and executed at self-support, which I never would have imagined before. And what that meant this year, it was a newish category of not using the shelter cabins or the um, lodges along the way or the water or the food that is available in those spaces. And so my husband and I, you know, we didn't go inside a building for six days and melt the snow for all our own water. And I never would have imagined three years ago when I did my first Iditarod that I would be able to survive, let alone do it in that style. If I remember correctly, you were kind of not too interested in getting into the cold weather uh, adventure racing stuff. Yeah, right? no, it's something I said I would never do. You're right. That's what I was, yeah, I thought it was something like that. <laughs> yeah. And, and really, you know, my friend Jay Peterberry, who's been, uh, you know, a longtime friend and ultra endurance athlete, he kind of kept pushing me, pushing me. And finally, I just listened to that curiosity of like, could I actually do this? And I think what really pushed me is that I realized that since Blood Road, which was my ride down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, I hadn't really done anything super committing and super scary in a number of years. And I kind of realized I missed that from my expedition days. And I mean, I feel like where I am right now is my adventure racing and my cycling have really met in this beautiful like expedition bike world now where, where I'm taking all my skills from adventure racing and bike racing and they're coming together in a way that I'm just having a ton of fun doing these big expeditions. And that's why when you ask me, what would my business card say? It's really Explorer because I want to do these big bike expeditions. And that's where my career is taking me right now, which is super exciting. And so, yeah, I'm still learning. I did Alaska because I had more to learn and I needed to see, could I survive in the cold environment? And I needed to kind of scare myself into something super committing and it's blossomed into, you know, me being invited to go do an Iceland crossing with Chris Burkhardt and Angus Morton. And like, it's opening doors that I never would have thought I would have had the skill or the ability to do. So that's pretty exciting. Can we talk about the Iceland trip? So absolutely. Chris Burkhardt came on the podcast and we talked about his interior traverse of uh, Iceland, which he did with Emily Batty, which is another Red Bull athlete. And maybe for people who aren't aware of it, you could tell, I actually don't know. Was it the same interior trip? You, he just did it when it was summer and now you did it during the winter or was it a different route? It was actually totally different. So their okay. summer trip that he did with Emily, they did it obviously in the summer. It was in the warmer weather, um, but they did an east to west crossing. And Chris really wanted to do a north to south crossing on a route that hadn't been done before. Um, and the interior of Iceland in the winter is quite hostile environment and nobody goes there, really. Nobody crosses in the winter. And he really wanted to cross a glacier. And so, you know, he spent a lot of time in Iceland. He's probably like an honorary citizen at this yes. point. And, you know, the place really calls to him and he, he wanted to cross it in the winter. And, you know, I was lucky enough to be invited because I have a lot of winter fat bike expedition experience. And so that led to him, you know, he's got a lot of bike experience and expedition experience, but not in winter on a fat bike. And neither does Angus, neither of them had really ridden fat bikes before. So there was a crash course in, you know, which equipment and all that. And that was really fun for me to bring my experience to that team. But he really put the route together and it was kind of his vision. And like, could you do it? Could you cross the glacier? Could you get through in the winter? And the answer is yes, we did get through um, and did a really cool north to south route. It looked brutal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it looked really painful. If we're talking about pain. Where did that uh, rate on your pain index? You know, honestly, Chris asked me that after the expedition. He said, was this harder or easier than Alaska? What I said to him physically for me, just on a pure physical level, it was easier because Alaska was racing, you know, riding 18 to 20 hours a day, not sleeping a lot, being outside in the elements the whole time. And so physically that was harder. I was more, way more trashed at the end of Alaska, um, from the, the physical endeavor, but I think emotionally Iceland was harder because there is this element, this really unpredictable element that is your constant teammate that you don't really want to have along of weather and the elements. And Iceland is notorious for just being super windy super unpredictable weather, really bad storms, and especially the wind. Even when there's not a storm going on, the wind is constant. 
And so emotionally, there was just this stress of like, is the wind going to be in our face or at our backs? And even when the wind's at your back, it's so strong and volatile that it's like blowing you over. It's taking your bike out of your hands. It's, you know, making you fall across the ice. So I think the emotional stress was much higher in Iceland because of the unpredictability of the weather. And basically you have to get to the shelters there. It is unsurvivable. I mean, we had a tent as an emergency shelter, but it is, it's not feasible to stay outside in the elements there. And so just sort of the stress of you, the weather predicts your pace and that you have to get to the next shelter. And there were, there were two days, day four and day six that we had to do double ride days. And it was only because we had a weather window. And so instead of stopping at the shelter, we planned, we had to just like keep going and do a 20 hour day because the weather decides there. So emotionally it was quite stressful. And, and also the route was changing based on, could we cross here? Would the glacier be passable? And so there was the unknown of an ever changing route, which for anyone who likes maps and, you know, does adventure racing, you want to know exactly where you're going. You want to know how much mileage you want to know how much elevation. And I had to just kind of be okay with like, a nebulous route plan, which was really hard for me to practice patience of like, I don't know how long today's going to be or how much mileage I kind of know, but it could change. That was really emotionally hard as well. So yeah, physically Alaska, emotionally Iceland, but I mean, we made it through safely and it was a really cool expedition. I feel like we got lucky on some really good weather windows. And then we had to wait out 24 hours, a really bad weather window and just sit in a hut for a whole day and be like, Hmm. <laughs> was there any, uh, water crossing, any river crossings? We had one water crossing that was really no big deal, but that was also a kind of this hovering sort of specter on your shoulder. Um, because they're obviously under all the snow is water. And so it's really just luck of the draw based on, is there a safe crossing for water? So it was always on our mind and, and constantly part of the navigational challenge, but we got really lucky and we really only had to cross open water in one place. It wasn't very deep, um, but we were prepared for it with lots of plastic and, you know, straps to put around our ankles. And, and I know in Chris's summer expedition, they had to go far off route just to cross one river. Yeah. It was a big factor in, in that route too. It was a big unknown. They were like, well, you know, we're going to just go out there and see, and you never knew if you were going to have to go way off route to get around a river or not, you know? How crazy is Chris? He's a photographer. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's really interesting how obviously he's a very accomplished photographer and, and filmmaker. And it's really interesting how he's now starting to bring, you know, his athletic endeavors into his photography. And, you know, it's a pretty new thing for him. I mean, he's been a surfer all his life. He's been an athlete all his life, but he's now starting to be the one on the expedition instead of filming the expedition. So I think that immersion is really cool. One, because he sees things obviously with a photographer's eye, but then to put himself in the middle of it is quite different. And to be, you know, suffering right alongside um, who's being filmed. And that is the goal for this film is, is to really get inside the mind of an endurance athlete. And so I'm kind of excited to see his storytelling in that way. Are you the athlete as I assume in this? Story? We all are. Okay. So it's telling the story of just different people on the same trip, different skill levels, all that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I mean, Gus is a filmmaker. He was fully immersed in the project and riding with us. And um, Chris is a photographer and he was fully immersed I think it, it was hard for him to try to do both. It's just hard enough to do the Iceland crossing. And so luckily he had a crew supporting him, but he's still looking at it from his photographer's eye. And, and so was Gus. So I think the immersion is really cool. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to see that. I, I mean, it's just great how much media, I mean, I, I, you've seen, I mean, I can imagine just how much more media there is and how much more demand. And it's coming from people who are interested in doing these kinds of things. What I'm really excited about is, yes, we did this cool expedition through Iceland, but this is one of the first times I've been riding with, you know, a film team other than Blood Road. And I'm really excited to actually share the expedition with other people because if I, you know, what I saw from Blood Road, that journey and, and doing a feature length documentary about my ride on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, 
it was amazing for me to do personally, but the even more amazing and exciting was actually to be able to take people on that ride with me and show people. And so I really hope Iceland can be that in hopes of taking someone on a ride through Iceland and inspiring them to design their own challenge or their own expedition in their own backyard or somewhere else. Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, you know, you're an accomplished adventure athlete, but you have a guy like Chris who he works his butt off and he trains and he works very, very hard. But, you know, he's only been riding bikes, I think, about five years or something. You know, seriously, I think it was about five or six years ago he said he picked up a bike on Craigslist and started commuting to work and then just got bit the bug. And now he's creating routes in Iceland that have never been done before and going on these crazy expeditions. And so that different perspective, like having his perspective as, as someone who's kind of new and learning about pushing himself. And then you have you who uh, obviously we're all always learning, but you've been doing it a while and you've got a few uh, tools in your arsenal that probably a lot of us don't have. So I think I think watching that with the two, or obviously you said Gus was there too, the different perspectives, I think that's valuable. And that's one thing I always try to do with the podcast is use it as a way, like we talked to people like Rebecca Rush, but the whole thing is Rebecca Rush started somewhere, you know? And so actually let's, you know, I would like to get into some of the earlier days, specifically Eco Challenge. And if it's okay, I want to set it up just a little bit um, for my own personal I guess, gratification because the eco challenge came at an extremely pivotal point in my personal life. People who listen to the podcast may be aware, but I'll give the, the brief version. But essentially for my teenage years up until about 20, I was a loser doing drugs and drinking and nothing really bad, but I got arrested a few times and just being a, a loser and figured out that that wasn't exactly a good path. So at the age of 20, so that would have been 2000. Yeah, I was 20 years old. I just, I quit everything and I started to run. The first time I ran was like 0.4 miles and picked up a bike that I hadn't, you know, I rented bikes in a long, long time. And it was at that exact same time that I found Eco Challenge. And then that became my everything. I mean, to this day, I have every single eco challenge recorded on VHS. You know, like I watched those things until the tapes ran out and that became my new drug. That became the thing that I immersed myself into and it pulled me out of, you know, drugs and a, a lifestyle that wasn't going anywhere to entering races and doing these, you know, duathlons and adventure racing and all, all this, you know, fun stuff, which eventually led into bikepacking. And now we're here, you know, so it's, it's really neat. I've kind of followed your career for a while now. And I, I think I'll just kind of wherever you go, I'll just, I know you're going in the right direction. I'll just continue to follow you. But I've been a huge fan of, of you and all those athletes in a, the Eco Challenge man for a long time and it really was extremely pivotal in my life and it completely like changed the course of my life so in some regards i just wanted to say thank you i mean i love hearing that and i do agree that movement and especially movement in the outdoors has a healing effect for all of us and i guess i'm curious what was it about watching those eco challenge tv shows what drew you in and what was the hook yeah well I mean, before I got into the drugs and everything, I was a Boy Scout. I was an Eagle Scout. My Eagle Scout, I did a bicycle rodeo. So I, you know, my parents didn't, didn't help me with anything. So I, you know, I went on the radio and I, you know, I announced the thing and I got Walmart to donate their parking lot. I got the city of College Station to bring their fire trucks and police to teach like safety on bikes. And I got the local, you know, bike shop to come out and teach how to fix your bike. And then we did an obstacle course. And, and, and all this stuff. And I did that at 14 years old, you know? And so I feel like I was on this path where like I was really kind of on the right path at a younger age. And then, you know, I started doing drugs and kind of got in with the wrong crowd and diverted from that. And so I just went back to what felt right to me, you know? And um, it's the same thing as bikepacking is once you saw that people could do, I didn't even know that was a thing, you know, um, yeah. I didn't know about adventure racing. I didn't know about bikepacking. I didn't know about all these things, but once I found out about it, it, it just became an obsession. It's like, wow, people can do that. You know, what drew you to it? 
Um, I, I think kind of like you, I mean, I love hearing that you as a kid, and I think most of us, we play outside as kids, we learn to ride a bike as a kid. And then for some reason, you know, you get a car or you go to college and a lot of adults lose that outdoor play. So it's cool that you found it again. Have you read uh, Fighting Nature Deficit Disorder by Richard Liu? No. It's this idea that we don't recreate outside anymore. We're very knowledgeable about the world from a, a book standpoint or a computer Google search standpoint. But, you know, actual real world immersion, uh, you know, unstructured play, all these things are not really present. So anyway, I think I think you would like that a lot. But I agree. I say often I'm I'm seeking you know, that same boy like wonder that I had at 10 when my mom, my mom was great. She would kick us out of the house and say, go ride your bikes all over town. I don't want to see you till dinner, you know? And that's what we did. We played in the creeks. We just rode our bikes all over town, me and my brother. And that's what I did yesterday when I went on my bike ride. I didn't put water and a little food on my bike. I didn't have a plan. I just, I just went and rode my bike and went wherever I wanted to go, you know? And I still, I love that just childlike wonder, go exploring, you know? I think that exploring is really important and I think we can all resonate with doing that as a kid. And then, yeah, where did it end that like sport or working out had to be like, you know, really structured or can you just go outside and play? And I, I think what's exciting about right now, you know, hopefully coming through a, a global pandemic and a, a really like worldwide traumatic time for a lot of people, a lot of people are finding the outdoors and they're finding movement and they're attacking that nature deficit disorder, as you put it, which I really like. And I think it's a real opportunity for anyone, whether they are, you know, an elite athlete or not an elite athlete to know that going outside and walking your dog or being in nature is absolutely healing. And if you take it to the next level, like you and I have, it really is a doorway to something else. And it's a, a journey, sports and outdoor, that's a journey that people will be on their whole life, hopefully. And so, yeah, I mean, I found adventure racing kind of similar to you. There was a curiosity. I was rock climbing at the time and a runner and a paddler and some adventure racing people who happened to be the royalty of adventure racing at the time. I'd never heard of the sport, but they came in. It was Ian Adamson, Kathy Sasson, John Howard. Like they were all in LA and came to my climbing gym for some reason to learn how to repel. And I was like, first of all, they came in, they didn't look the part. They were wearing all this like tight Lycra and all the climbers are like, who are these people? And I kind of was too. And they're like, we need to learn to repel. I'm like, well, this is a climbing gym. We climb here, you know, and repel is just like the way to get down. And they're like, well, we need to learn it for this adventure racing thing and practice it. And blah, blah, blah. I'm like, fine, I'll take your money. So I like charged them basically to come to the gym and repel a bunch of times and practice with their climbing equipment which I thought was totally ridiculous. And I didn't know who they were, but I, I became friends with them. And because they walked into the climbing gym that day, and that was really my entry into adventure racing is, as most people know, those teams were co-ed and there weren't a lot of women doing it. And so, you know, by meeting those guys are like, oh, you rock climb, you paddle, you run, you don't ride a bike. Well, that's okay. And I got basically just like plopped on a team <laughs> for a race that was happening in Malibu, a 24 hour race that happened to be a eco challenge qualifier and this ragtag team of us who had no idea, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, we actually won the event and we beat like Mike closure and all these people with matching uniforms. And they're like, who is this? And honestly, the only reason I did it and said yes to that race that, you know, I'd never done anything 24 hours in my life, not even like sleep 24 hours. straight. <laughs> so I was pretty intimidated by it, but I did it. We, we won the event. It was the hardest thing I'd ever done. Um, and it opened the door to travel. And so we got invited to go to Morocco and I was like, well, I don't really want to do this for a week. It sounds horrible, but, or no, it was Australia. And I was like, but I really love to travel. I want to go to Australia. So I kind of looked at it as this one-off opportunity that I shouldn't say no to. And that, you know, we didn't finish Australia, you know, teammates got sick, but then I had the bug of curiosity really to go exploring physically these different countries in the world in different places, but also to explore myself and starting to learn that like, 
wow, you go really deep on these ultra endurance things. And that was intriguing for me. So I, I found it the same way you did out of curiosity. And I felt like I was that little kid getting back into the backyard and camping out. You know, I do the same with my mom, like, can I camp in the backyard this weekend? And so I've always had that childlike curiosity and my sport has been the mechanism to fuel it. And while I've been a climber, adventure racer, rock climber, paddler, now cyclist, it's all the same, you know, it's all just a way to explore outside, but to explore myself as well and learn about myself. I couldn't say it better. That's what I always say. I mean, the podcast is about getting people outdoors. My preferred method is the bike usually, but I just got off a river. We Have you done a bike pack rafting where you... Yeah. You like, yeah, have you, okay. I just did it for the first time in Northwest Arkansas and it was so much fun. Like to me, like the idea of putting, you know, 190 pound guy, then 55 pounds of gear on top of a five pound little inflatable raft and going down rapids and stuff. Logically in my mind, that doesn't make sense, but I'll tell you what, it is a lot of fun and the boat like handles really well. Pack rafting, yeah, it kind of blows my mind. And we first experienced that in, in an Eco Challenge race. But now a good friend of mine, Steve Fastbinder, I did a really cool trip with him through Bears Ears. And yeah, we pack rafted. I'm like, wait, we're putting all these sharp objects onto this inflatable boat. And I'm going to fit in there too. And we're going to go there. And it's just really cool that, like you said, you know, to find a tool that can help you explore. And I remember rock climbing was the same for me. Like we can use this equipment to like go up this cliff face. I mean, it's amazing what humans and sports can do with, with good equipment and, and some education. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious how popular is the eco challenge? Like in my universe, it was huge, but like, does it come up very often? Are you, is it like a well-known thing or? Well, it started to because they had a, a, you know, a resurrection and they had last year brought it back after a 10 year hiatus, which was really cool. And I, I will say, you know, Eco Challenge, those years that that was all being televised, that basically created reality TV show. It created, you know, a whole genre of now there's a million shows that are like putting people out in nature or coming and filming stuff that's unscripted. Naked and afraid, man versus wild. It's, I mean, totally. just everything. Yeah. Yeah. And for people who don't know, Mark Burnett, the guy who does like Shark Tank and Survivor and is the same guy that did Eco Challenge. I mean, he's kind of a visionary. It was his introduction into television. And yeah, he he obviously was on to something of, of putting people in nature, in a team atmosphere, seeing what would happen. And he too, like us, he went and did a race called the Raid Galois years before and was taken by like, wow, this is a really cool event. People are outside, they're traveling in teams. And so he didn't invent adventure racing. He invented the Eco Challenge, but it was actually a sort of knockoff of the Raid Galois and the Southern Traverse and other really cool expedition type events that had been going on for a while. But he really popularized it and everybody was watching Eco Challenge when it was on TV. And okay. it was some of the best TV ever. But nowadays people are like, adventure racing? Like, what's that? And when I explain it, they're like, Ooh, that sounds really cool. And I, I think it's, it's kind of having a little bit of a revival now with, with some multi-sport, you know, and there's still small races out there, but not the really big expedition ones. No, but it is kind of funny. I mean, you know, I just created a route for uh, the Big Bend National Park and, you know, I threw in hiking in there. There's a couple hiking routes and uh, I'm looking at doing, you know, a bike pack rafting where you raft part of the Rio and then ride. But I mean, it's all just kind of, it's just adventuring, really. It's just, you know, yeah. finding a way to traverse uh, across the land and explore different parts of it. But yeah, I was thinking about it as I was preparing for this. I mean, it's kind of not that far off from adventure racing just kind of call it something different <laughs> but maybe it's just, just yeah it's just getting it's exploring and that's why i like to use that word and people are like you're an athlete i'm like i'm an explorer you know i just want to go out and yeah the bike is my chosen medium right now because it's so accessible you can go so many places but yeah you throw in pack rafting hiking you know and and push a lot of my Alaska winter expeditions, people are like, why do you want to do that? You have to push your bike so much. You have to walk with your bike when the snow conditions don't allow for you to ride. And, but honestly, it's being able to access a place like Iceland or Alaska in the winter and be able to get there on your bike. I don't mind pushing for some of it because it, it allows you to go to places that you never thought you could go on a bike. 
I was talking to Matt Mason, who created the Monumental Loop in uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico, and he's a through hiker. He's a hiker, you know, and but he moved to this place with this vast desert and no water. And then fat bikes came along. And so he's now, you know, a bike packer because it opened up the, a land that was not really able to be explored just because of lack of water. But if on a bike, you know, you can get out there and he's got a 300 something mile route out there. So that's the thing. But a, then a raft will open up stuff a bike can't and, and your feet in wilderness areas and other places open up areas that a bike can't. So it's all that's good right. stuff. <laughs> Even though it's called Bikes for Death, I do other stuff too sometimes. <laughs> so let's, in 2006, you lost a sponsor for your adventure racing. And that was, I think, a pretty pivotal time where I read an article from back in the day. It was kind of fun going back and doing some research. And you're like, well, I'm either going to find a nine to five or, you know, I might as well try mountain biking. I think it was something along those lines. Do you remember that time? Yeah, that was a really pivotal moment in my life. And it, it, two things happened. One, I lost a friend. A friend died in front of us, you know, on another team. And my teammate was injured um, with Rockfall during an adventure race. And that was a real eye opener of questioning, you know, why am I doing this? You know, and, and I felt kind of betrayed by my sport because what happened, you know, Nigel died on course. And the race halted for a little while. You know, there was discussions about safety and, and everything else. And then people kept racing, you know, for the prize money. And they started it back up again. And I felt a little bit like that wasn't my tribe anymore. And so, you know, yeah, I lost a friend and I lost my motivation for adventure racing and really questioned what I was doing in sport. And then also at the same time, lost our major team sponsor. And so I was like, well, well, the world is really telling me something right now. And, you know, I called my team and said, okay, well, that's over and called my remaining sponsor, which was Red Bull. And I said, well, we don't have a team anymore. We don't have team sponsorship anymore. Like it's kind of over. I, I, it's time for me to go get a real job. And really what they said to me, it was, it was pretty pivotal and it was a dark space for me of like, what do I want to do? And, you know, what I, my identity for 10 years, you know, as a team captain and my job was, was suddenly gone. And it was like, who am I? What am I doing? And what Red Bull said to me is like, well, you have another year left on your contract. We're not going to take the money back. Just find something else to do for a little while. They really pushed me to do some soul searching. And I started thinking about, you know, I loved being outside. And basically the thing I was good at was going for a long time. And so I tried to look at, you know, I looked at ultra running and was like, I don't really want to do that. I ran in college and it didn't call to me. And the longest thing I could find, I'm like, all I'm good at is going long. And the longest thing I could find was 24 hour mountain bike racing. And I happened to meet some friends at the time who were like, let's go do 24 hours in Moab. And we'll just, it really was some girlfriends locally in Idaho. And they're like, let's just go do this as a fun road trip, camping trip thing. And my now husband, Greg Martin, he had been doing 24 hour solo mountain bike races. So he agreed to be our um, crew chief and like kind of help us figure it out. And so um, me and, and three riding girlfriends, it was like a healing trip to the desert. And it, we did a four person team called catch Him if you can. And uh, we weren't pro or anything, you know, we entered expert and we ended up having this really cool battle with a really good team and ended up winning that, you know, winning. And what was more exciting for me is I ended up having the fastest lap times of any of the women on the course, including the pros. And given though, I was running every technical section because I couldn't ride a bike at all. Like it was my worst sport, literally. But, um, so I'd get off, I'd run super hard down the technical stuff. I'd jump back on and pedal really hard on the dirt road and the easy parts. And so my husband, Greg, now husband, Greg, he's like, you should try solo. And so he helped me. The next race I did was a solo, um, a solo ride and I beat all the men and the women. And same thing. I was running the technical stuff, but I was like, I can stay up all night, one night, no big deal. I'm used to staying up for a week. And so one, I had the food and like the endurance dial, I just didn't really know how to ride a bike, but that was enough. And it was like launched up even more exciting part of my career. I mean, that was 15 years ago and, and launched a bike career out of, 
you know, my worst sport and, and what I thought was, you know, the death of me being an athlete really came from, from cycling. And so I have Red Bull to thank for pushing me into the unknown and my husband for saying, you should try this. And my friends, you know, really my girlfriends rescued me when I was in a really down place. We just went and rode bikes in the desert and it opened up a whole new career opportunity for me. That's been really fruitful and really amazing, but that came out of the loss, so to speak, of what I thought was my chosen sport. And now, like I already touched on, what's really exciting is I feel like it's all coming full circle and that I'm taking my adventure racing experience with navigation and, you know, exploring and doing these big bike expeditions. So it's almost like it was meant to be in that way. I don't know. It seems like life kind of works out as long as you're like purposeful about your life. And I feel like you're an active participant in your life. It seems to work out. You know, if you point it in a direction and you work to get there, bumps and stuff come along the way, but it does seem to work out. Yeah. And I think what always pulls me out of those dark places, and that was a really dark time, I'm not going to lie. And what pulled me out was um, friends and being outside, you know, doing sport and somebody else believed in me, even though I didn't. And, you know, so it, it's community and, and, you know, being outside are always kind of my saviors. Do you have some thoughts on what it is about endurance sports that is an equalizer between, you know, oftentimes in sports, we see gender and age being categories that you're placed in, but, um, and we still see that in endurance sports, but not as much, but what you do see is, women beating men. I mean, Lael doing transcontinental and beating all the, everyone, you know, and do you have some thoughts on what it is about endurance sports that creates a, a more even playing field? Yeah, I do. Because the skill set that is required in ultra endurance activities is far broader than just your physical, you know, how many Watts you can push on a bike or what is your FTP? There's so many more skills that are required to execute a good expedition. You know, you've got to have planning skills. You've got to have navigational skills. You've got to have the ability to, you know, figure out your fueling. Um, so there's so much more involved in your brain and your body than just, you know, how fast can you go for a given period of time? And, you know, Leadville 100 is, is a good example of that. And it, even though that's only a hundred miles, I've won that race four times. I've done it a bunch of times. I did have the record for a while. I broke my own record a couple of times, but in that event, I never once in all of my wins, I was never in the lead until 50 miles, 70 miles, never in the lead at the beginning. Um, and you know, I had, I had one guy at the finish line one time say to me, he's like, why do you start so slowly? And he had finished just a couple minutes behind me. We're in the finish corral and I had just won the race. And he's like, why do you start so slowly? And my response to him was like, why do you finish so slowly? Cause here, here we are at the finish. <laughs> I'm in front of you. So obviously I've got a tactic that works here. So, but it was just kind of funny, but back to your point is the skill base that's required to execute ultra endurance events is far more than your physical prowess and, and sort of how big your legs are and how many Watts you can churn out. There's, and I think that's why you see mountaineering is very similar. You see in these really long committing types of events where the more experienced athletes are doing better. You know, you see mountaineers well into their fifties, you know, a 20 year old mountaineer, you're like, Ooh, <laughs> you know, how's that going to go on Everest? Because it, re it requires a lifetime of, I think, um, intellectual maturity, um, you know, experience on the trail experience with failures and how to get through them. There's just so much more to it than how fast you can go. So experience and I have to think the mental, I mean, experience, I think builds your mental uh, acumen as well. Do you do any mental training per se? Yeah, I do mental training now. And I think this is, this is kind of the Holy grail of sports physiology. I mean, there's been sports training programs, science-based for a long time of like how many intervals you should do and, you know, periodization and when you should rest and when you should go hard where there isn't a lot of, and, and there's starting to be is brain training and what is happening, you know, what neurochemicals are released or how do you calm yourself when you're stressed out? And that's a little bit of what I touched on that I implemented in Alaska was this, you know, sort of energy breathing work 
that is calming your nervous system or bringing up your nervous system if you if you need the energy. And so learning how to actually control our brain is absolutely a skill that I think athletes are really catching on to now. And you see a lot of younger athletes implementing meditation, implementing visualization, implementing, you know, different kinds of brain training. And so that's there, it's coming, but it's also really exciting for, you know, any athlete, professional or not, knowing that you can still improve and have breakthroughs far, you know, longer than, than we ever expected. And, you know, an example of that is, you know, I'm 52 and I'm hitting numbers that I was hitting, you know, with my coach 10 years ago, but I'm also doing, like I said, for Alaska, I'm doing things I didn't think were possible. And one it's because I'm physically can keep training, but two, I think it's because my brain is stronger from years of doing this endurance. So I've been doing it for years. You, you've been doing it, you know, on these long rides, you're practicing. It is a practice to do endurance sports. And I think what's happened to me in the last, you know, since blood road, the last few years is I'm actually understanding what I've been doing on the trail all along. I have a science-based knowledge of like, Oh, this brain chemical is being released or, Oh, this is happening. Even though all along, I was implementing those strategies just naturally, but I just didn't know why or how, or I didn't have the actual tools of like a specific breathing technique or a specific way to like scan your body and relax things. And so there are a lot more really cool tools, performance tools for people that um, are really exciting. And then I try to implement a lot of that in my own training, but I'm also trying to share it with others. And, you know, in the sort of giddy up challenge or Rebecca's private Idaho training program that I have, it's not just a training program for my coach. It is that, but it's also a mindfulness expert that I'll bring in or, you know, a nutritional expert and bringing in all the layers of performance. You know, it's not just, like I said, how much time do you spend on the bike? flogging yourself. There's a lot more to human performance that's really exciting that happens off the bike or happens without having to put in another hour on the trainer. And I think that's exciting because it unlocks potential for for everybody, not just me. What are some tips maybe that you could share because you have had such a, a, a long career and like you said, you're still very active and very competitive what are some keys to longevity in endurance sports and really pushing your body in these ways? And I mean, you keep asking your body to do things and it keeps <laughs> stepping up to the challenge. You know, that's, that's impressive because a lot Thank of, you. I mean, you look around America and it's like, you, you know, it's like, gosh, dang, we need more examples of, you know, people who keep their bodies in motion. I mean, I, I had a uh, Hal Russell who, I don't know if you know him, he's done the tour divide six times. He didn't even start riding a bike until he was 57 you know? Yeah. So yeah. anyway, I love longevity. So any tips you have? Yeah. I mean, I think the main thing is consistency and doing a little something every day. I, it's really hard if people like have this really aggressive training program and then they crash and burn and drop off for two months, or you set a like new year's resolution, like I'm going to do like all this amazing stuff. I'm going to train 15 hours a week and I'm going to do a marathon and it's too high of a goal. Whereas if people just said, I'm going to move every day for half an hour or six days a week for half an hour, that actually gets you a lot farther. And, and I really learned that from my coach right now, Tim Cusick. You know, I was in a big slump really just a few years ago. And I had kind of Blood Road and Blood Road Film Tour had really, um, and just trying to work and build my businesses, I had kind of fallen off the training and was really struggling to get back on. And his first words to me is like, well, we just need to get back to consistency. Like, we're not going to worry about intervals and this and that. We're just going to get you moving six days a week again, because it's been a while. I'd be sporadic and I'd train and then I'd like not do something for a week. And so honestly, for anyone out there, it's, it's consistency and it doesn't have to be this big, audacious, hairy thing. Like honestly, go take a walk for half an hour and leave your phone and, you know, your digital stuff. And suddenly you'll be out there and you're like, Ooh, I'm going to run for a minute or, or just get on your bike. And then maybe you'll find a hill and, and you'll suddenly the motivation will come if you just get out there and move. So that's my, you know, biggest piece of advice for people is consistency. Um, lifelong consistency is really important. 
it has to become part of your lifestyle because then you start to reap the awards. You start to feel better. You start to be in a better mood. You start to, you you're know, in the vitamin D, you're getting the endorphins. Yeah, you're getting your vitamin D. You're working through all your stress. It, it's absolutely a stress reliever. And, and people want a magic pill to, to longevity and happiness and health and wellness. And it's actually exercise. You know, it really is. It checks all the boxes. So, um, that's my big advice is, is, you know, longevity and, or is consistency. And the other thing that I notice, you know, now is I have to think about what I call the spaces in between and I have to put attention there. So what I mean is I got to stretch a little bit more. I've got to, you know, have a tennis ball under my desk while I'm sitting there on a webinar and I'm rolling, you know, the balls of my feet. So I have to think about mobility and stretching a little bit more. I think about nutrition more, you know, hydration. Am I getting the right supplements? And those are the off the bike, the, the non-training things that, that are really performance enhancing. And I think as you age, you can't, um, we all age, you know, <laughs> every but day you can't cut right every day. <laughs> you just can't cut the corners as much as I did when I was 20, you know, like lack of sleep or this or that or the other, you can, you can fudge it a little bit more when you're younger and you just can't fudge it as much, you know, as you age, but it, I mean, why not implement getting enough sleep at night? You know, you're in a better mood. Why not implement drinking enough water or getting your, you know, greens every day? I wish I'd been doing that a little more consistently when I was 20 and 25 because I, I would have had even better performances. But so that's it. The spaces in between is what I call, you know, putting attention to those other things and just moving every day. I had a specific question in regards to training from one of my patrons about the Leadville 100. How specifically did you train for that and really acclimatizing to it? Because for anyone who doesn't know, it's I mean, it was billed as the world's highest race. I think it might still it like starts at 12,000 feet or something crazy. <laughs> It doesn't start at 12,000 feet, but it, it is like the highest mountain bike race in the world. Um, I think it starts at 10,200 feet okay, or it goes something up, yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is, is the town of Leadville. I'm in Texas and, in case you didn't. I'm at 278 over here. Anything <laughs> over a thousand feet is, you know, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> It's crazy high altitude. And because of that, it has a very specific requirement. It's not just a hundred mile race. And so, you know, I went there kind of on a whim after my third 24 hour solo win, I was like, Oh, you know, kind of went there a little bit haphazard showed up the day before went and, and, and ended up winning it and was just like, Whoa. And it was really cool. It actually kind of started this trajectory with my coach and with training to get very, very specific on that race. And I was like, I want to come back and see if I can break the record. And so I got really bike specific, um, with my coach and the subsequent years that I won the other three years, I would go out two weeks ahead of time and live in Leadville and acclimatize. And, you know, it was a very specific training program with that being my one specific key race. It was totally different from the 24 hour solo racing I've been doing. It was the first time I basically really trained for what I call short events. I mean, Leadville is short for me a seven and a half hour, super high intense ride at super high altitude is a very different training requirement than a 24 hour solo event. And so, yeah, my coach at the time, Dean Golich, we got really serious and very scientific and very specific. And it was the first time I'd had a coach in that way since high school, you know, it was kind of my back to coaching experience, you know, and now I've had a bike coach um, ever since then. But that was a real education for me of learning about how I'd never used power before. I'd never, you know, I, I, I train, but like, I didn't really train, yeah. you know, I just went and did stuff. I just went and did long stuff. So it was really actually quite an awesome education. Those, you know, Leadville years, and then the subsequent bike racing years of really honing in on pedal stroke, watts, all the nerdy science of bike training, which now is really serving me to take, like I said, that adventure racing mindset, ultra endurance stuff with really specific bike training. And now with my coach, it's kind of a, a mix of those two things that is really cool. I feel like I needed both to yeah. be able to be where I am now for expeditions like Alaska and Iceland. I was just talking to Lael. She was on the podcast a few episodes back and 
she doesn't have a coach, you know, she never has. And so I, I meant, you know, we talked about it and she's like, I don't know, maybe I'd be better with a coach. And, but, and, and I wonder, I mean, she is so successful and, and she, you know, trains by feel and is just mostly, it seems like having fun and, and really that fuels a lot of it for her. Obviously you can't tell her what to do, but from your own experience, you know, you had some raw natural talent, obviously, and some abilities that you had harnessed and 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 uh, and developed over a uh, a long period of time. And then you got a coach, and obviously you you've stuck with them. So, is do you think that's the path forward for everybody, or is that just what worked for you? I mean, it was a massive tra- trajectory in my cycling career. I don't think if I if I hadn't had a coach, you know, coming off twenty I, the twenty four hour solo stuff, that was natural ability, and I started implementing a coach partway through that and Leadville, and absolutely, I think every single person could benefit from a coach, and and here's why: it's total accountability. You've got to show up to work. And and that's motivating for me. Somebody would be like, hey, this is on the schedule. You know, we're not usually going to choose and be like, man, I need to do these really hard, heinous intervals today. You know, we don't often self-select that. But I'm going to tell you, doing that hard stuff works. And if your goal is, is increased performance, having a coach works because of accountability and because of the science behind it. The coach is a lot more educated than you are, I am, about the science of training. And so there, for me, it's like, I don't have to use brain power on like, what should I do today? I'm like, oh, Tim has designed this. I know it's going to work. He knows what my goals are. I'm just going to go do it. And so for me, I kind of like being told what to do in some ways. But that said, I mean, you mentioned, oh, Lael's just having fun. She doesn't have a coach. It's very important that your coach implements having fun <laughs> in your rides. And so like there's lots of free form rides that are just just go out for four hours, do whatever you want. Right. And he knows that I need that. One, because I'm training for long things, but also emotionally, you know, nobody wants to do intervals every day and they don't work to do intervals every day. And so there's a lot of fun and there's a lot of play, you know, implemented in my training program. I would think that would be important to continue to enjoy what you're doing. You know, it can't be all grueling, all misery all the time, you know? No, it can't feel like a job. And a good coach is, re- it, you know, understands that and understands, hey, there's, you've got your goals and then you've got your play time and then, oh, life gets in the way and you didn't do your workout that day, that's okay. Let's readjust and let's, you know, so it's, it's kind of like having a great teammate that's doing all the behind the scenes research. And then often my coach, Tim too, he can see that I'm getting tired or need to shift something before I can see it because we're always like, I've got to do this, or I need to, you know, work and run a business and do all my training. And, you know, it's a lot, we ask a lot of ourselves and a good coach is going to be like, Hey, like I'm there right now, my training, this, last week for my coach was be like, walk your dogs for at least an hour every day. That was my, all my training schedule because he knew I'd come back from two really big back, back to back expeditions and I'm burnt out and I'm on the cusp of being overtrained. And he's like, okay, you need to walk your dog for an hour every day. I'm like, okay. And yeah. it was really cool. <laughs> yeah. I like what you said about it. Just, it takes that away from it, it takes it off your to-do list. Like you don't have to plan your own training. You don't have to, you don't have to be thinking about that. You, you, you work with a coach who understands you, understands your needs, understands your body and all these things. And, and yeah, develop something specifically for you. And then you don't have to worry about it, you know? Yeah. And I know it works. And so you know, I trust yeah. him and I know it works. So I'm like, great. I'm not spinning my wheels. I'm not wasting time. And that's part of it is efficiency as well is, you know, like, Hey, I've got an hour and I'll tell him I only have on Mondays. I can't do any workouts. So now Monday's my rest day. Cause it's a really heinous work day usually. And then, so we've shifted to basically, you know, have shorter workouts during the week, longer stuff on the weekends. Yeah. And I mean, a big part of what I offer, and I actually, I share my coach with a lot of people. Based on my experience, we've developed, he runs a program called Base Camp. And so for Rebecca's Private Idaho, we implemented an eight-week training program for Private Idaho Base Camp, where my coach writes programs. I bring people into the mindfulness and, you know, some of the mobility and some of the other tools I use. And we actually we actually train as teammates because I know not everybody's going to get um, an individual coach. Yeah. But so I we basically designed a program together to, to let people into my world. World and, and give them access to some of the stuff that I have access to as a pro. And so 
um, I'm pretty excited about that stuff because I'm able to share what I'm learning with everybody else. And, you know, no matter what your goals are, you know, the RPI base camp training program, the, we have a giddy up training program as well. And then a winter base yeah, camp. Yeah, designed specifically for that event. Yeah, which is what exactly. you like. We're talking about Leadville. I mean, you know, you need ideally if you're going to do tackle something like that and a, a training program that is designed for that event, you know, exactly. Yeah. So if someone wants to be my teammate, all that stuff's on Rebecca's private Idaho and on my website, Rebecca Rush. But yeah, Giddy Up Challenge is coming up end of May. That's the next ride challenge that I have out on the table for people ride or run challenge, which is kind of cool. Tell us what the, I know the Giddy Up is coming up. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about it? And because, uh, yeah, just plug it a little bit. Yeah, it's awesome. And I launched it last year. It's only the second year of Giddy Up Challenge. And I launched it because I was not motivated. And my coach said, What's it going to take for you to get off your butt and get consistent again with your training? And I said, Well, I need a big challenge. You know, I need something that scares me. Um, I need something on the calendar. And of course, we were right in the heat of COVID and, you know, no events were happening. And so I designed Giddy Up Challenge initially as a challenge for myself to safely be able to have a big, big, hairy goal, but also as a fundraiser through Be Good Foundation to feel like we were doing something about COVID and raise money for COVID relief. And so I'm keeping Giddy Up Challenge going this year because it was such a massive success. It was so awesome. We had 11 countries participate, people around the world. And what it is, it's an elevation challenge. So you pick a hill anywhere near you, anywhere in the world, and you can do a quarter Everest, a half Everest, a three quarter Everest, or a full Everest. So the, the amount of elevation equivalent to Mount Everest or those you know, segments down and you pick a hill on your bike and you go up and down it a bunch of times um, until you hit that elevation challenge. And what we do is we, we give you the tools of how to plan your route on Garmin Connect, how to load it in your Garmin, how to record it, how to, how to figure it out. How do you do it? How do you set up your aid station? What kind of food are you going to eat? And so it's set up to help people have an outdoor backyard adventure anywhere around the world. And so, and yeah, it's also true. our number one fundraiser for the Be Good Foundation. And this year we are targeting all of our fundraising at protecting public lands and the open spaces and partnering with groups like Protect Our Winners and Outdoor Alliance, Conservation Alliance. So not only are you challenging yourself, um, but we're raising money. It's all raising money to protect the places that we go to, you know, have our nature therapy. And so people can sign up now. You can set up a fundraising team. You can get a little posse to do it in your own community and you can do it on foot or on bike. And that's at giddyup.rebeccasprivateidaho.com or you can Google search my name at Giddy Up Challenge. Um, but yeah, that's the end of this month. So that's what I'm training for right now. And yeah, I'm actually awesome. going to mix it up. I'm doing a half Everest on bike and a quarter Everest on foot. So I'm actually doing, mixing it up and doing a, a foot. So will you be competing in two different events then? Or how yeah, does that? Yeah, so you have, well, you have all Memorial Day weekend. You have four days to execute okay. your challenge, Friday through Monday. So people can pick whatever day they want to do, sign up for whatever elevation, whatever mode, indoor, outdoor, foot, bike. Um, and so I'm going to do the ride challenge, a half Everest on Friday and then take a rest day. Okay. And then on Sunday, I'm going to execute the uphill uh, run slash hike challenge quarter Everest with a bunch of friends on Sunday. And so, yeah, people can, can do it however they want. We had families last year who they all did it together and they all did different elevation challenges and it's pretty fun. And I know a lot of people are excited because, you know, things are starting to open up. We could get safely outside again. And so for me, this is, this is a big training weekend for, you know, whatever goals or events I'm going to end up doing next. But yeah, I hope people will join me because it's, yeah. it's really fun. And we have nine countries sent, signed up so far and we're all kind of connected as a community online and digitally. And like I said, I'll educate you and teach you how to put together your route um, and execute it at home. Boom. I have to ask about one that's uh, another interesting tie in with us is I was interviewing Chuck Campbell, the creator of the Arkansas High Country route. I was interviewing him when you rode past on the uh, Razorback Greenway uh, setting what was then the FKT on the Arkansas High Country. Since then, I think it was Ashley. Oh, I forgot her last name. 
uh, took it away. So any any thoughts on going back? Uh, that's more in the bike packing realm where I live. Any any thoughts on going back and taking back the crown? Um, yeah, yeah, that is in my mind. And I was really excited to see Ashley break, you know, break my record. I think that month I had two of my FKTs taken away and <laughs> different, different things. I was like, oh, that's a tough month. Um, <laughs> that's a yeah, rough Kate, month. <laughs> yeah. Kate Boyle took my Coca Pelli. Oh challenge yeah, that's right. I interviewed her, uh, by like 13 minutes too, or something. Yeah, it wasn't a lot, but I was like, oh, man. But I mean, actually, I'm excited. I mean, records are meant to be broken. You know, th those records motivated me to get out there. But yeah, the Arkansas High Country route, I have to give kudos to Chuck who designed it. I mean, he did such an amazing job. And to be able to be the first one to like try it out and, you know, execute his baby was really special. And that first ride, I mean, obviously I was trying, I was trying hard. It was super hard. I had horrific weather and, you know, I didn't totally know the route. And so I do want to go back and execute it um, more cleanly. And now that I, I kind of know what Arkansas has to offer and how many hills it's are steep. there. People don't and know. <laughs> it's so hilly. Oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, I, I might go back this year. That might be one of my, um, my primary goals for the years to go back and uh, see how I can do on that course a second time. Any other bikepacking events stand out to you? I have, well, I have a homebrew sort of one um, that I'm working on here in Idaho, connecting some some of the bikepacking routes through Idaho with Kate Boyle, the woman who uh, broke my uh, Coca Pelli record, and another woman, Sophia, who are all Idaho bikepacking female residents. So we're going to put together a cool expedition in our backyard. Oh, good. Um, well, so Idaho pretty, is beautiful. And oh man, I mean, yeah. Clearly it's something so cool. in the water there. <laughs> Even I mean, I had Jacob Hora on and you got Jay Peter Vera, you got Kate Boyles, you got you. It's just like something in the water. Yeah, it's a cool place and I love being here. So yeah, I'm gonna do some homebrew stuff with some Idaho residents. I keep trying to taunt uh Jay into doing something together with me and maybe with Jacob. And yeah. so yeah, I've got some home plans for sure. Um, awesome. Yeah, but the next up is Giddy Up Challenge. And and I actually signed up for an ultra run this year, my first ever oh, wow. ultra run, um, also in Idaho. Uh, so that's part of why I'm doing Giddy Up partially on foot is I need to do some run training. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's another sport I'm interested in, but only in watching, not in participating. You know, I never thought I would be interested in it. And the reason why is because it seemed just like, really painful to run a hundred miles or run that long. But, um, I chose this one at home stand hope and it's only 60 K. So it's just on the cusp of an ultra run, but uh, it's, it's pretty technical. And so it's, and it's really hilly. And what I've learned about ultra runs is that people walk, they walk the uphills. And when I learned that I'm like, Oh, I can yeah. do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah if you watch them ultra run it's kind of like fast mall walking a lot of the time yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so once i learned you didn't have to run the whole time i'm like okay i think i could do one that has a lot more hiking and scrambling and so i'm kind of excited to again like kind of go back to my roots i started as a runner in mm. high school and college oh, so wow, that was okay. my first sport so yeah I'm, I'm i'm going back to my roots a little bit there you've done it all and uh, including now you've been on the bikes for death podcast this must be a career highlight. <laughs> I've made it. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. So if anybody, they want to follow along with everything you got going on, where do they find you? Yeah, I'm at Rebecca Rush, R-U-S-C-H. And that's on social. Um, you can join the Giddy Up Challenge via social. Rebecca's Private Idaho is also open. And, and I will say what's exciting about Rebecca's Private Idaho is my you know signature gravel event that I do every year. It's uh, Labor Day weekend and er, first weekend of September. But we also have an in-person version, RPI Sun Valley, the typical one. But we have RPI Remote, which is similar to the Giddy Up in that you can execute the route. We help you build the route. You execute it at home. And we have the eight-week RPI Base Camp training program. And so I really have opened up my world, hopefully to make biking more accessible for people to empower people to like put together their own adventure. So both Giddy Up and RPI, even if you aren't coming to Idaho, those have versions that you can do anywhere in the world. And so 
I really do want to encourage people to join me as a teammate, because like I said about the Iceland adventure, you know, I have my own personal goals, but a really big part of my mission statement is to inspire other people and to get other people outside into nature um, and being the best version of themselves. So that's my pitch to like, join me and come ride with me and come run with me. Um, and I'll teach you everything I know. That's awesome. Sounds like a good deal to me. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. You have a great day and uh, go train or something. What are you yeah. going to go do? Well, Monday's the off day. You say Monday? Oh, today is Monday. Today's Monday. So today's business day. I'm self-employed. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like you. I'm like, I don't know. what day it is. You sound like you have a better schedule than I do. You're like, you even know what day it is. <laughs> All right. We'll have fun doing all your business again. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Be good. All right. Will do. Bye-bye. Okie dokie, folks. I hope y'all really enjoyed that episode. If I may say so myself, that might have been the triple crown of bikepacking interviews right there. Lael Wilcox, John Watson, Rebecca Rush. It's been totally enjoyable to get a chance to chat with all of them. I hope you're enjoying them as much as I am. This episode was particularly enjoyable. There's just something about her wisdom that really came through to me. And maybe I was a little enamored uh, because I've looked up to her for so long and I know how long she's been at this. And you got to respect uh, the type of effort she's been able to produce, the types of results she's been able to produce, and the grace with which she does it. And I mean, just like, seems like a super solid, nice person. That's kind of what you expect almost. Uh, you know, I would expect, I don't know, I'm not too big into other sports, but for endurance sports where you push yourself and you spend a majority of the time outside, I almost expect people to be like a little bit more calm, a little bit more thoughtful. They figure some things out because you really, like she said, it's a doorway of of learning about yourself and to grow it's always an honor to sit down with some of these elite athletes and pick their brains. So thank you, Rebecca, for coming on the podcast. But more greatly, thank you for just being a, a total badass and an inspiration to, you know, what could be countless people around the globe. It was a real honor to have her on the podcast. And hopefully we'll have her back on because I'll be honest, I had a lot more questions. A quick reminder that if you are enjoying these episodes, if you like this type of content, your support is greatly appreciated. You can check out all the ways you can support the show over at bikesordeath.com. Every little bit helps and is always appreciated. Thanks to you, beautiful people, we have reached our goal of $500 a month on Patreon. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. That is huge. And as promised, I'm working on getting the new patron-only podcast up and running called Shifting Gears. We got a conversation going on at the private Facebook page group. If you're a patron, head over there, jump on the conversation. We're going to be talking about, you know, format, guests, topics, all kinds of stuff. So if you're wanting to learn more about what that podcast is going to be and you're a patron, head on over, join the conversation. I'd love to hear from you. And if you've been enjoying the podcast and have been on the fence about becoming a patron, this might be an excellent opportunity. More content is going to be available only as a patron. One of those catch 22 things. But the good news is you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month, $12 a year. It's basically like a six pack of your favorite beer. Buy me a six pack of your favorite beer. That's a good way to look at it. And with that means we need a new goal. So I'm a dreamer. I don't mind aiming high. Aiming high means maybe you miss low, but maybe you get your target, right? Maybe you get exactly what you want. The next goal is Patrick quits his job, his real job, the real estate one that distracts me from making more and better podcasts, from doing more traveling, from meeting more of y'all and doing all the things that would be a lot more fun to do than selling houses. Don't get me wrong. Listen, it's been a great career. I'm not going to bash it too much. But I mean, if we're talking about the choice between selling houses or talking about bikes and talking to cool people, I'm going to go with bikes for death. You know, I guess I don't have to convince you all of that, huh? So 
if you want to help me quit my job and really reach the next goal of this podcast, which is to really ramp it up and make this my full-time job, put some information over on Patreon. So if you want to learn more about that, uh, head over to patreon.com forward slash bikes or death. And that's it. Thank you all for supporting the show. It is always appreciated. I also want to remind you to head over to experiencefayetteville.com. Check out all the details about the Arkansas High Country Race. Registration opens June 1st, so that's coming up. You might want to put that on your calendar. And don't forget also to go check out the great products that they have over at hefe.bike. That's J-E-F-E dot B-I-K-E. And again, patrons of the show get 10% off. Woot, woot. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. It has been a pleasure. Always so much fun to be here with you. But now the episode's over. So go ride your damn bike. It was the middle of the night. You grabbed your knife and you held it tight. The sounds of beasts kept you awake. The sounds they made kept you afraid. In the morning, you packed your bike. Memories forgotten from the previous night. You rode faster than ever before. Was it your imagination or merely folklore? Fear turned into strength as you pushed further. Every pedal stroke stronger and firmer. Your bike feels weightless. Your legs aren't tired. You think to yourself, just a few more miles. Bikes. More death. Bikes. More